The shame of retreat now on for humiliation for an empire in great military blunders. Cinemas didn't show this film in wartime Britain. It depicts the Japanese army on bicycles, sending the British into retreat. It wasn't the first reverse the British had suffered since 1939, but it was perhaps the most humiliating. It happened because the British commander broke one of the cardinal rules of warfare. Never underestimate your enemy. Armies have different ways of underestimating their enemies. They assume they can outgun them or outmaneuver them. They believe their will to win is stronger, that theirs is the better cause. But the most dangerous mistake is unthinking prejudice. Contempt for an enemy based on who he is and what he looks like often proves fatal. In the heyday of empire, 12,000 British troops invaded the Zulu nation. The British were anxious to develop southern Africa. The Zulus were in the way. A short, cheap war was the answer. At the Battle of Rourke's Drift, British bullishness seemed justified. Here, thousands of Africans were held at bay by a small band of British soldiers who, as a result, were immortalized in painting, poetry, and film. Much less is said of the battle that immediately preceded it. This is Isandlwana. Here on the 21st of January, 1879, the unthinkable happened. A Zulu army wiped out an entire British force in a battle the British had always expected to win. The British were not just outnumbered that day, they were outsmarted. I think that there's a psychology which pervades the British, which resulted in this catastrophe. And it manifests itself in, uh, in a complacency, in an underestimation of the enemy, attributing, uh, attributing them with little more than being brave savages. Hoo -hoo! The British force, under the command of Lord Chelmsford, a friend of Queen Victoria, was heading for the Zulu capital. Chelmsford decided to set up camp for one night at the foot of Isandlwana. So unconcerned was Chelmsford about the Zulu threat that he failed to take even the most elementary precautions. Chelmsford failed to entrench the camp. He did not dig a peripheral trench around the borders of that camp. Now this was a stipulation in the general orders, and by not doing so, he effectively disobeyed the standing instruction. Chelmsford was to be flayed in history for not entrenching this camp. He fails to draw his wagons into a defensive arrangement, a lager. Chelmsford was to be crucified in history for not lagering. This is a contemporary cartoon. There's a certain arrogance, being superior, very um, professional army, well-trained. And how could this possibly have happened against the British 
in a campaign such as this was absolutely inexplicable. The British soldiers who invaded Zululand knew themselves to be the most powerful fighting force in the world. The British Army, really from top to bottom, from Lord Chelmsford down to the ordinary soldier, uh, had an innate belief in their own superiority. Uh, they felt that their white skins and their discipline and their technological superiority actually made them pretty much superior to anybody. Of course, because the reality is that they were far by far better armed than the Zulus. In any case, uh, you might say it's an element of racism, but still, this was just a bunch of savages too. Who perhaps they thought once they shoot, they might they would scatter in all directions, but but they were quite shocked to find that it wasn't the case. The king of the Zulu nation did not want this war, but he was prepared for it. The Zulus had a proud military tradition. The king's army was taken seriously by those who'd seen it in action. White settlers had warned Chelmsford of Zulu prowess, their speed and endurance, their ability to fight in large numbers skillfully deployed. But Chelmsford's only African experiences had been in the Eastern Cape, where his enemy had used hit-and-run guerrilla tactics. He was convinced the Zulus would want to fight in the same way and that he would have to force them out. Never thinking that the Zulus might want to face him, Chelmsford sent out a patrol to find them. Here we actually see the Zulu army using tactics, which today, this very day, we use in battle. They put in a masking movement. Their scouts saw this puny little patrol approaching the vanguard of the Zulu army. Well, what did they do? They sent out scouts to act as bait and invited this patrol to fire a few fleeting shots at them before disappearing into the long grass. Napoleon is reputed to have said that the general who makes the fewest mistakes wins the battle. The Zulu generals undoubtedly made the fewest mistakes. If one starts to tell you those, the British one finds a very considerable list. At 1.30 that night, Chelmsford heard that his patrol had encountered the Zulus. He gave orders for half his force to prepare to leave the camp. At 4.30, Chelmsford led his men out to join up with the patrol. Chelmsford was leaving the camp at half strength and taking his forces in the wrong direction. The Zulu decoy had worked. They had a picnic attitude towards the whole thing. And I think that is very dramatized by the fact that Sir Lord Chelmsford, Chelmsford himself had breakfast that morning, I mean, with all the silver and things. That shows the, the disdain, really, that there is an element of disdain in their attitude. The day of the battle began with Chelmsford miles away. Chelmsford left Lieutenant Colonel Henry Poulain in command of the camp. Poulain was essentially a military bureaucrat. He had never heard a shot fired in anger. Henry Poulain was in his tent, which was next to Chelmsford's tent. At this moment, a picket, a lookout, comes in from that ridge line on the skyline with rather a startling message. He salutes Poulain and he says, Colonel Poulain, there are thousands of Zulus on the top of that plateau and they're apparently advancing towards the left front of the San Luana camp. And Poulain walked across to where the men were having their breakfast and he ordered them to leave their breakfast and they were told to form up in a skirmishing line to face the threat. The soldiers grumbled at having to interrupt their breakfast. Neither they nor their officers seemed concerned. One of the officers who survived wrote home afterwards, well, we had seen equally large bodies of men on the Cape frontier, uh, and we were not alarmed in the least, for we never dreamed for a moment that the Zulus would come on and attack us. They should have been worried, very worried. The main Zulu army, 25,000 strong, 
was camped just four miles away. Once again, in absolute brilliant fashion, the Zulus managed to effect the ultimate in surprise. It was behind this plateau that the massed Zulu army lay hidden. And some sources reckon perhaps as many as a number of days before the Battle of Isandwana went down, um, the Zulu main army was already hidden there. At 11.30, a British patrol headed up to the plateau. They were about to get the shock of their lives. One feels one's hackles rise, as these men say, dear God. Suddenly we had to rein in our horses to prevent our horses from falling into a huge valley. And they gazed aghast at what was in this valley. Below and beyond them, stretching off along the course of that Ingwebini street, off in an easterly direction, as far as the eye could see, packed in there, squatting in absolute silence upon their great war shields, regiment by discipline regiment, with the Zulus of the main Zulu army. What a moment that must have been. When the British patrol saw the Zulu army, out of desperation or stupidity, the 30 men fired on the 25,000 Zulus. The Zulu response was immediate and chilling. Regiment by regiment, the whole army began to move. The patrol fled back towards the camp with one flank of the Zulu army giving full chase. The news soon reached Henry Boulain. Boulain's attitude in this moment was, I have got 1,774 men. Of these men, 1,000 are veteran soldiers equipped with modern breech-loading lever-action Martini Henry rifles. These rifles can deliver 12 rounds per man per minute. They can fire accurately a 600-grain slug of lead accurately at ranges up to 800 yards. I put it to you that Poulain's attitude in this tent is roll on Zulus, roll on, and we'll thump the blighters in the open. The British soldiers began their well-rehearsed procedures, but the Zulus had more surprises in store. At 12.40, one of the men suddenly glanced away from the Zulu attack. The traditional Zulu tactic, known as the horns of the buffalo, was moving inexorably into position. The second flank of the Zulu army had appeared. Soon the horns of the buffalo and the chest were firmly established. The next stage, as the horns close, is called eating the enemy. Zulu tactics required them to charge right into the massed firepower of the British army. Their casualty rate was enormous but still they kept coming. Another factor had come into play on the Zulu side, motivation. Everybody knew that this was a foreign army coming into Zulu territory. This was somebody who had broken the doors down of the house and had invaded. That was realized by the men who, thought, who fought this war and who had to run across this valley to get close enough to those guns to kill the people firing them. Call it a charge, if you will. Can you imagine charging that distance across this valley into, repeat, into rifle fire, rent volley firing? Very difficult thing to do. This was chasing the burglars out. But then the Zulu advance faltered. The Martini Henry rifles were having the desired effect. There's certainly a point fairly early in the battle when the British seem to be winning. The men uh, seemed to be in good spirits. They were laughing and joking uh, and convinced they were giving the blacks an awful hammering. Uh, and there's very much a feeling, again, that this battle is going to go the way that the British want it to go. The Zulus were pinned down, unable to move forward, hiding in the long grass. Then from the ridge, an old Zulu chief strode onto the battlefield in front of the crouched warriors and screamed at them to move forward. Your king never ordered you to lie down. He ordered you to fight. <laughs> 